Welcome back, Clinical Problem Solvers. This is Jack here, and I'm really excited to get to talk with you today about our diagnostic schema for a gastric mass. We're going to talk about two key elements of the gastric mass schema today. The first is going to be paths to the problem. What we mean by that is the clinical presentations that may clue us into the possibility of an individual having a gastric mass. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to build together a diagnostic schema that includes some potential causes of a gastric mass. We'll talk about the major categories of disease that can cause a gastric mass, and we'll fill in together some example diagnoses that fit within each category. So let's first start off with this idea of paths to the problem. Again, what are the signs and symptoms that individuals may present with that could clue us then to their potentially being a gastric mass? Now, in order to answer this question, we have to ask ourselves, what types of symptoms can masses cause? So take a few seconds to think to yourself, what are some of the clinical presentations that I may have seen in an individual who has a gastric mass? To understand what symptoms a gastric mass can cause, we can think to ourselves about what types of things gastric masses can do. Again, masses of any type involve an abnormal proliferation of tissue. And as that abnormal proliferation of tissue develops, we can sometimes see that tissue erode into or lead to problems with the nearby vessels. And so one of the paths to the problem of a gastric mass is going to involve occult GI bleeding. It's important to note the word occult here. What we mean by that is the slow, indolent, progressive GI bleed rather than the acute GI bleed. So individuals with gastric masses, while they can present with acute GI bleeding, are much more likely to present with a slow, indolent GI bleed that we may discover, for example, by picking up iron deficiency anemia. The other symptom that gastric masses can cause is going to be the symptom of early satiety. Now we said that masses involve abnormal proliferation of tissue, and that abnormal proliferation of tissue can take up space. Taking up space within the gastric lumen can lead to less volume for food whenever we eat. And so for those reasons, individuals with gastric masses may find that they are having early satiety. In other words, the sensation of feeling full very, very quickly. The third thing that masses can do is they can cause pain. In the same way that abnormal proliferation of tissue may bleed, or in the same way that it may obstruct the lumen and lead to early satiety, it can also stretch and compress nearby tissues and structures, and that can lead to the presentation of pain. Now, there are multiple ways once we have these symptoms for us to discover that the gastric mass is there. And ultimately, we may find ourselves, number one, getting a CT scan. And you can imagine evaluating the individual who may have early satiety and abdominal pain with a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, which may pick up an underlying gastric mass. Similarly, an individual with an occult GI bleed, we may say, you know what, I'm actually going to reach for an endoscopy and consult the gastroenterology team to see if they could look inside the stomach to see what could be potentially causing this underlying bleed. So our other key diagnostic test is going to be an EGD. Now, ultimately, to make a diagnosis of a gastric mass, we're going to need to sample some of that tissue. An EGD allows us to undergo tissue sampling, but a CT scan does not. And so if we detect a gastric mass on a CT scan, we're going to ultimately reflex to the EGD so that we can make a tissue diagnosis with biopsy. Now, depending on what the biopsy shows, that will give us an answer to what the underlying cause of the gastric mass is. So let's talk about what some of the things that we may discover when we make a diagnosis of a gastric mass. When you think about the different categories of disease that could cause a mass anywhere in the body, not just in the stomach, think to yourself about what types of disease categories you may think about. 
I'll give everybody a few seconds here to, again, think about some of the different disease categories you might think of. Now, I'm going to give you a way to think through causes of mass that you can take to the bank and apply to any part of the human body. Right? In this case, we're going to use it for the stomach, but this is a framework that I learned from Dr. Gupreet Dhaliwal as a way to think about the different categories of disease that can cause a mass. Okay? We can have benign neoplasms. We can have malignant neoplasms. There are different autoimmune diseases that can cause masses, different infectious diseases that can cause masses. And because no framework is perfect, we can always also include the category of other. And so again, whether you're dealing with a mass in the lungs, a mass in the intra-abdominal space, or in this case, a mass in the stomach, this general framework of benign, malignant, autoimmune, infectious, and other can be a scaffold that you can use. So let's double click on each of these categories and ask ourselves what types of diseases fall into the gastric mass schema based off of these different categories. When we think about benign lesions within the GI tract and specifically within the stomach, there's two we can think of. Number one is going to be an adenoma. And number two is going to be a polyp. Again, these are going to be benign lesions of the GI tract, but we can also have malignant neoplasms. And the big three to think about is going to be the most common which is adenocarcinoma. If there's one cause of gastric mass that you remember from this whole video, I want it to be adenocarcinoma because it is by far and away the most common malignant neoplasm of the stomach. But if you wanted to fill in some others, there's two other big ones to think about. Those are gonna be lymphomas and neuroendocrine tumors, which we're going to abbreviate as NETs here. There are several types of gastric neuroendocrine tumors that may be associated with other different diseases. For example, type 1 neuroendocrine tumors are associated with things like atrophic gastritis. Type 2 neuroendocrine tumors of the stomach are associated with things like Zollinger-Ellison syndrome or multiple endocrine neoplasia. And then there may be sporadic or idiopathic neuroendocrine tumors as well. But these big three, adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, and neuroendocrine tumors, are some of the types of malignant gastric masses that you may see. In addition, we could think about things like gastrointestinal stromal tumors, which are usually going to be sub-epithelial masses. In other words, masses that are not emerging from the epithelial layer, but from just below the surface of the stomach epithelium. In certain populations of individuals, for example, immunocompromised hosts with AIDS, we may think about something like Kaposi's sarcoma or KS, which again is going to be oftentimes seen in individuals with AIDS. And then finally, you can see gastric metastases. These are going to be solid organ tumors that metastasize to the stomach from elsewhere in the body. Moving on to the autoimmune category, there are certain autoimmune diseases that have a particular predilection for causing mass-like lesions. For example, IgG4 disease and sarcoid. Within the infectious category, in the same way that there are some autoimmune diseases that tend to cause masses, there are also certain infections that can take on a mass-like structure. Right? Characteristically, we, we might think about TB or mycobacterium tuberculosis. And whenever you think about TB, it's worth also thinking about endemic fungal infections, for example, histoplasmosis. And finally, there is one specific fungus that we can think about in very immunocompromised host, for example, individuals who may have profound neutropenia or solid organ or stem cell transplants, and that's going to be mucor. Right? So we have mycobacteria and fungi as possible mass-forming infections within the stomach. Histo being our example of an endemic fungal infection, and mucor mycosis being one of the molds that can cause masses, again, especially in immunocompromised hosts 
like individuals who have undergone solid organ or stem cell transplant. And then finally, we get into the category of other, right? Diseases that don't necessarily fall into any of these discrete categories, but that can still cause a gastric mass. And the two that are worth mentioning are peptic ulcer disease and amyloid. Somebody can have a gastric ulcer, and that gastric ulcer has a very large inflammatory response that can lead to raised edges and an inflammatory mass within the stomach that can look like some of these other diseases and cause a gastric mass. So to recap what we've talked about so far, when we think about a gastric mass, we want to remember the different paths to the problem, the symptoms that somebody may have that may clue us into the possibility of there being a gastric mass. The three classic symptoms that are worth remembering are going to be occult GI bleeding, early satiety, and inflammatory abdominal pain that usually develops over weeks to months. When we have any of those symptoms, we may find ourselves going down one of two diagnostic routes or both. And those are going to involve a CT scan, which may show us on cross-sectional imaging that an individual has a mass in the stomach or an EGD, where we take a direct look inside the lumen of the stomach and see a mass there. The EGD allows us to take a tissue sample and make a diagnosis with biopsy. And those diagnoses may fall into one of these categories that we have here. Again, benign lesions like an adenoma or polyp, malignancies like gastric adenocarcinoma, lymphoma, or a neuroendocrine tumor. And then much less commonly, we may see an underlying autoimmune disease like IgG4 disease or sarcoid, or one of the infections like a mycobacterial or fungal infection. And then finally, in the other category, we may discover that actually this gastric mass was caused by something like peptic ulcer disease or rarely something like amyloid. So that covers it, CV Solvers. If you like this video, please do show your support and give us a like below. And please do leave your comments to share something that you learned or any ways that we can make these videos better in the future. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.